Hello, good morning everyone. Jessica Miller here and we're going to talk about number eight. I'm a little bit behind on these. So, I sound like I say that every time I do a live video. I'm a little bit behind guys, sorry. Um, I've done a couple of posts but I haven't followed up with the live videos so we're going to do some catch up this week before the end of the year. Hope everything is going well with you um, and that your end of the year is as eventful as the beginning of the year. <laughs> I don't know. I'm looking forward to 2022. I think it's going to be a good year. So let's dive right in. So I want to get um, started with number eight, uh, the jury trial where the verdict was reached outside the courtroom. Um, I did this blog post a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I will put a link to it in the comments so that if you prefer to read it rather than watch me talk about it, um, you can do that as well, whatever your preference is. Um, and so let's just get started. So number eight for me uh, involved uh, a lot of information or processing of uh, non-evidentiary issues that can affect a verdict. So we take a lot of effort, everyone involved in a jury trial will put a lot of effort in to keeping our jurors insulated from any outside influences that could affect their opinion of a case while the jury trial is going on. The court gives them instructions that they cannot do any independent investigation, they cannot look up or research the people involved or on the internet, they can't research any legal concepts, and lawyers and investigators are ordered not to speak directly to jurors at all. Uh, we can't even say a good morning or a hello, and we have to avoid even the appearance of impropriety while a jury trial is going on. The jury trial is supposed to take place inside a bubble. Uh, the lawyers guide the facts to allow um, the lawyers guide, guide the facts as allowed by the judge, and the court instructs the jurors on the law. And so it's the jury's job to apply the facts and the law in that little bubble to see if a crime was committed. And then, of course, proving that is a prosecutor's job beyond a reasonable doubt. So number eight for me was a battery case. It was between two women who were involved in a road rage incident. The defendant in this case got mad because she thought the victim's vehicle had cut her off and refused to let her pass um, as both vehicles were traveling down uh, Forbestown Road in a rural part of Butte County. Uh, the defendant followed the victim into the parking lot of a grocery store and confronted the driver of the other vehicle about it. Our victim, who was a passenger, got out of the car uh, and stood between the defendant and the driver of her vehicle, telling the, the defendant to leave. The defendant grabbed the victim by the hair and punched her in the face numerous times and left a bruise over her left eye and a clump of hair pulled out. At trial, the defendant claimed self-defense, saying the victim struck first by chest bumping her numerous times, forcing the defendant to stand her ground. Now, in assaultive crimes, it's the prosecution who has to prove that it was not self-defense. Uh, this can be a tricky thing to prove. Like, how do you prove a negative, right? Um, we usually rely on facts and circumstances of the incident, things like who threw the first punch, who initiated the negative conduct, severity of the injuries or their location of the injuries, past history between the two parties, things like that. And we usually rely on circumstantial evidence to show that the only reasonable conclusion was that the defendant did not act in self-defense. Defense can bring in character evidence of the victim, showing they have a tendency to be violent, and it's only then can we rebut that with character evidence that the defendant was doing the same. So, needless to say, self-defense is tricky. Uh, and in this case, the only witness we had uh, was not, who was not directly related to the road rage incident, didn't see the beginning of the fight. Uh, to further complicate matters, every witness in this case, including the defendant, provided slightly different versions of events on the stand. The case was three years old by the time we got it to trial. And while everyone tried their best to remember what happened, details just fade over time. So our victim in this case testified, and she was put through a rather brutal cross-examination regarding her tendencies towards violence. And she got a little heated with defense counsel on the stand, but overall, she handled the pressure okay. Um, but what happened outside the courtroom after she was done testifying ultimately swayed this jury to a not guilty verdict. The jury had been released for lunch and was walking out to their cars, and as they did, they saw our victim yelling at someone on her cell phone. Uh, she was standing in the hallway of the courthouse while she was doing that, and uh, the jury later told me they believed that the victim was quick to anger based on how she conducted their, herself in their presence. So in a perfect world, 
Um, the jury would not have seen our victim in a hallway yelling on her cell phone. It was not part of the trial. It was not evidence, and it should not have been considered. Uh, but we don't try cases in a perfect world. Um, and the fact of the matter is that everything that happens in a jury's presence can and will affect the outcome. Uh, and this one was outside my control. Um, the inability to control it was a frustration on my part, but it also taught me to be aware of what everyone involved in the trial is doing at any point in the jury trial, uh, because we really do want to preserve that bubble the best that we can. So that's number eight. Um, have a great week, you guys. Um, hopefully I'll get the rest of the ones that I've written up and to you before the new year. I will talk to you all soon. Again, I'm Jessica Miller, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.